So I'm going to now bring our second speakers. Um, our second speaker is Ilyich Gol. He's an assistant professor in mechanical and materials engineering at Portland State University. Uh, professor Gol needs the university's Healthy Buildings Research Lab um, is seeking to seeking to develop new approaches to improve building sustainability through um, addressing building use, uh, energy use, IAQ, and well-being. And he is presenting today on the mitigation of fine PM exposures in schools. Okay, thank you, Renyu, very much for that introduction. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to share some recent work on fine particulate matter exposure in schools that we've been working on. And I want to extend a, a thank you for everyone who's tuning in and also a thank you for the committee for the invitation for the opportunity to come speak. I'm going to start my talk uh, concerning air pollution in near roadways schools. Um, under the idea that if we target school environments that are at risk for elevated air pollution levels and targeting vulnerable populations, we can develop interventions and strategies that can be used more broadly. Uh, we should care about schools in general because they are a critical environment for a susceptible population. Specific to the issue of near roadway schools, around 15% of schools, which houses 6.4 million children, are located within 250 meters of distance from a major roadway. Uh, I'm showing here in the bottom left a breakdown by state of the percent of students that attend a school within proximity to a major roadway. It's also been shown that schools with a higher fraction of Hispanic, Black, and Asian students have disparate air pollution exposures. So this is an important environmental justice issue. And traffic-related pollution, so schools in near roadway environments exposed to elevated levels of traffic-related air pollution, adversely affects student health and cognition. For example, traffic-related air pollution exposure has been associated with increased asthma diagnosis, as well as metrics like decreases in scores of working memory and other cognitive markers. I'm showing a result here in the bottom right from a study of over 2,700 students in Spain called the BREATHE study, where they showed that within their cohort, students that were in a, who were in a higher exposure to black carbon, uh, ultrafine particles, and nitrogen dioxides, important what we call traffic-related air pollutant constituents, had lower scores of working memory uh, over four visits that uh, were conducted to evaluate cognitive performance of those children. Okay, so simply put, uh, air pollution challenges in near roadway schools are that there are elevated air pollution levels. Complicating the challenge is that these elevated air pollution levels may be temporally and spatially variant, and that meteorology is, can be quite important. Throughout this talk, I'm going to reference some recent work that my research group has been involved with, with a local middle school here in Portland, Oregon. I'm showing a picture here in the upper left of Harriet Tubman Middle School in Portland, Oregon which uh, was renovated in 2018 and, and reopened to serve the North Portland region, which is uh, where Portland's historically black community uh, resides. So you can see in this picture, this is Interstate 5 and Harriet Tubman Middle School is located immediately adjacent to Interstate 5. I, I'm showing in the bottom of this slide measurements we made at the school site for three particulate matter metrics, black carbon, ultrafine particles, and PM 2.5. And what I'm showing here are what are called polar plots. These polar plots combine three pieces of information, wind speed, wind direction, and a measurement of an air pollutant, in this case, made at the rooftop of the building prior to the renovation of the school. So this is when we deployed for an air monitoring campaign to measure the extent of impact at the site due to the near roadway location. And what we see is that when air is moving from the southwest, so moving across the freeway, impinging upon the school, we see a large mass of black carbon and ultrafine particles when air is coming from, when wind is moving from the southwest towards the school. And black carbon and ultrafine particles are again, two important traffic related air pollutant constituents that are within, contribute to fine particulate matter. 
Now, more generally, looking at PM 2.5 levels at our site, we see that there is some relationship with wind speed and wind direction, perhaps associated with the freeway, but in general, the extent of elevation of a metric like PM 2.5 in a near roadway site is less substantial than that of specific traffic related air pollutant constituents like black carbon and ultrafine particles. And so this is important for a, a, a number of reasons. Health impacts associated with traffic related air pollutants like black carbon and ultrafine particles are thought to be greater than that of PM 2.5 more generally. And the second point is that standards, ventilation standards like ASHRAE 62.1 trigger increased filtration efficiency only if the national ambient air quality standards are exceeded. And so PM 2.5 is one of the national ambient air quality standards that ASHRAE 62.1 references. And at our site at Harriet Tubman Middle School, and I would imagine many other near roadway sites, we're in regional compliance for PM 2.5 and therefore, unless an engineer or building designer identified the near roadway source in a site survey, there would be no increased filtration efficiency triggered by compliance with ASHRAE 62.1. The final point that I wanna make is that schools are concerned about both indoor and site outdoor exposures. And we'll talk a little bit about that during this talk, uh, but mostly focusing on indoor exposures to fine particulate matter. There have been a lot of work done on traffic related air pollution in urban environments. And we know that there are strong spatial gradients of traffic related air pollutants in urban environments. Within a zone of around two to 500 meters from a freeway, we see elevated levels of a variety of constituents associated with vehicle emissions. During the nighttime, that zone may extend to thousands of meters, but for school environments, we're probably most concerned about the daytime gradient of traffic related air pollutants. I'm showing here a nice summary of the literature as of 2010, Carter et al. Uh, published work looking across a large number of studies that characterize this spatial gradient of traffic related air pollutants. And what they're showing here are pollutants normalized to the concentration measured at the edge of the roadway. So everything is normalized to a value of one at the edge of the roadway. And they characterize the extent of the drop off of the concentration of a specific pollutant as you move away from the edge of the roadway. They bin pollutants by the steepness of that drop off. So we see on the left pollutants that have a rapid drop off more than 50% reduction in concentration in the first 150 meters from the freeway. And I'll note that within this, we see elemental carbon and ultrafine particles. So part of contributors to fine particulate matter that are um, the focus of, of, this, of the beginning of this talk here. For pollutants with less rapid or gradual decay, I'll note that we see PM 2.5 in general, this metric that Jeff just mentioned, uh, the mass of particulate matter less than 2.5 microns. Uh, has a more modest trend with increasing distance from a roadway. And the opportunity here is that we can leverage this spatial gradient in traffic related air pollutants in near roadway schools to potentially reduce exposure. One way that we might do that practically is by considering where outdoor air intake is sited and increasing the distance of outdoor air intake from a roadway. We characterize this at our school site by deploying concurrent monitoring for black carbon and other air pollutants on two faces of the school, of Harriet Tubman Middle School. We deployed monitoring on one side of the school oriented towards Interstate 5, shown here in blue. And a second monitoring deployment was made on the face of the building oriented towards a surface street called Flint Avenue. We deployed this monitoring for about a week and I'm showing a snapshot of those results over the hours that the school is expected to be occupied, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I'm showing in this plot, the black carbon concentration in an hour, on an hourly average basis. And you see that on the measurements made on the Interstate 5 side of the building, we see a, a much stronger increase in black carbon concentrations compared to what's happening just 80 meters away on the Flint Ave side of the building. And at peak periods, this increase in distance, which causes mixing and dilution of traffic related air pollutants is roughly equivalent to a Mervate filter uh, placed on the outdoor air intake. That's a very approximate ballpark, but essentially what we're realizing is a passive uh, treatment effect 
taking advantage of the steep gradients and traffic related air pollutants to reduce the concentrations of air pollutants that might enter the school if the outdoor air intake can be cited accordingly. Another opportunity is to leverage what are known about diurnal trends in traffic related air pollutants. Uh, the literature has generally shown that traffic related air pollutants peak between 7 and 9 a.m. due to the presence of a rush hour traffic. And what I'm showing here in this plot is are our measurements of black carbon made at our school site at Harry Tubman Middle School in Portland, Oregon. For black carbon measured over about a month of monitoring in this case. And again, this is measured in outdoor air prior to the renovation of the school. And we see consistent with the literature, a peak in levels of black carbon at our site starting at about 7 a.m. and ending at about 10 a.m. And so one opportunity for reducing student exposures then would be to simply shift activities to later in the day if activities are happening outdoors at the school site. And so in the case of our, of our school and our work with the school district, what I'm showing here is uh, spatial mapping that shows how leveraging these diurnal trends and traffic related air pollution in combination with spatial trends can be used to reduce student site outdoor exposures. This inlay shows the school here highlighted in blue and just to the north of the school here is a park where students go to have lunch and have recess. And so what we did is we did spatial mapping of ultrafine particle concentrations in that park and around the school site with a handheld condensation particle counter. And you can see as the researcher walked along the interstate, we see very elevated levels of ultrafine particles in exceedance of 100,000 number per centimeter cubed. As the researcher then moved into the park away from the freeway, we see again evidence of that steep gradient of ultrafine, ultrafine particle concentrations. So the combination of location and timing can be used to potentially reduce student exposures to fine particulate matter in schools. The idea of altering timing based on knowledge of outdoor air pollutants that might be impacting a school has been explored from the context of a quote unquote smart ventilation system. A study of four schools in Ottawa, Ontario explored the possibility of trying to take advantage of this known diurnal trend in traffic related air pollution by having an early start for outdoor air ventilation. So they explored the possibility of turning on outdoor air ventilation for an hour from 5.30 to 6.30 a.m. when the building was unoccupied. At 6.30 a.m. they turned off outdoor air ventilation and put the school in recirculation only mode until students arrived at either 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. This four schools, two had a start at 8 a.m., two had a start at 9 a.m. For the schools starting later, the schools starting at 9 a.m., they saw significant reductions in ultrafine particles and volatile organic compounds in those schools. They hypothesized they only saw it in the schools starting at 9 a.m. because then the um, restart of ventilation coincided with the time post uh, this rush hour peak of, of outdoor air pollution. A third approach would be to consider active air cleaning. So Jeff talked a lot about filtration and various metrics of how to evaluate a mechanical filtration intervention. Here I'm, I'm going to summarize the literature in terms of air cleaning effectiveness. We also heard about this concept of a metric of effectiveness uh, last week in the, uh, the workshop presentation. So what I've done is I've looked across the literature for air cleaning effectiveness measurements in only occupied schools. So looking for what is the in-situ effectiveness when students and teachers are present in the school. And what we see looking across the literature is that filtration can be effective, filtration interventions can be effective, but that the results are quite variable. Uh, there are relatively few studies, however, I was able to identify eight studies of, of occupied schools with an air cleaning intervention. The interventions uh, that were studied are uh, filtration, improving the efficiency of filtration in the HVAC system, or deploying standalone air cleaning uh, mechanical filters deployed into classrooms, for example. And so we see, uh, looking across metrics of effectiveness for both black carbon, and for PM 2.5, we see that removal effectivenesses can be 80% or higher. 
however, looking across the studies, the more typical or average removal of effectiveness is on the order of 40 to 50 percent. And each of these studies discusses the particulars of the intervention, but as Jeff mentioned, these uh, filtration interventions, it, it's a system, and there are other contributors that can ultimately drive the realized effectiveness of an intervention. So things like the presence of indoor sources, the location of the intervention in the case of standalone air cleaners, uh, how leaky the environment was, these sorts of things all contribute to the variability we observe across these studies. Um, looking uh, at the school that we worked with here in Portland, Oregon, I mentioned that the school was renovated. Um, I'm showing a picture of the school pre-renovation in 2018, followed by post-renovation uh, after the school, um, the school district and mechanical contractor opted to uh, install a single air handler that served the entire school. And in that air handler, um, it, advanced air cleaning systems were installed. That consisted of a MERV-8 pre-filter, a MERV-16 filter, followed by a functionalized carbon that targeted gas phase species that might be elevated in, in a near roadway environment. The thinking that evolved from our work with the school district and the mechanical contractor that was working on the project to renovate the school, uh, ultimately we uh, worked towards what we thought was a reasonable minimum goal for the, the renovation of this school. And that was to attempt to reduce traffic related air pollution in outdoor ventilation air provided to the school to be at least equal to that of a school located in the urban background with a standard filter. And so again, I, th I think this is a, a not unreasonable minimum goal to, to look for for schools in a near roadway environment. And so to do that, we can calculate the, the source strength of traffic related air pollutants in outdoor ventilation air. And so I'm showing an example of that for black carbon, which again is a contributor to fine particulate matter. And so the, the design goal here would then be to attempt to set the black carbon source in school ventilation air so that if the school is located in a near roadway environment, uh, the source has, the school then has air cleaning with efficiency that it reduces the source, source to the same as that would be present if the school were located in the urban background. We can calculate that source of black carbon in outdoor air as a function of the outdoor air exchange rate, the concentration of black carbon in outdoor air, and the removal efficiency of air cleaning systems on outdoor ventilation air. And I'm showing that in this uh, equation here, where I simply set those two um, scenarios equal to one another, and I'm solving for the removal efficiency necessary for a school located in a near roadway environment to be, have the equal source strength to if that school had been located in the urban background. And so I mentioned previously uh, that we made measurements of black carbon uh, at our site as a function of, of meteorology. And from that we, and other measurements, we were able to determine that our site had approximately five times the black carbon levels as that of the urban background when the meteorology was um, conducive to transport from the roadway. And so with that ratio and a, an assumed removal efficiency of, of black carbon from a standard MERV-7 or MERV-8 filter, what we're able to determine is that our design goal was at least a removal efficiency of 84% for black carbon at this school. So looking across the literature, there is, um, and as Jeff also uh, presented, there are resources for understanding how filtration interventions um, might realize a given particle removal efficiency. I'm showing here a summary of removal efficiency as a function of particle diameter and MERV rating of a filter. And you see that um, as we increase the MERV rating of a filter, we realize higher single pass removal efficiency. Um, on the right, what I'm showing here is an estimate of the effectiveness of our installed intervention. So I'm showing here a one week snapshot of monitoring of black carbon in our near roadway middle school, again, with a MERV-8 and MERV-16 filter installed. Um, 
what we see here are three uh, traces on this diurnal plot. We see black carbon and outdoor air and red, and we see that accumulation coincident with uh, morning rush hour traffic. And we see uh, in blue and in green, the traces associated with return air or indoor air and uh, green is what's being pushed from the air handler to the school. Essentially, we see a, a decoupling of indoor air from outdoor air at about 6 a.m. when the air handler turns on, and we're able to maintain indoor black carbon levels to around 150 nanograms per cubic meter and maintain a, a intervention effectiveness of around 85%. Okay, so up until now, I, I've mostly been focusing on outdoor air quality issues in near roadway schools. There are certainly indoor sources of fine particulate matter that need to be addressed, especially if um, targeting um, PM 2.5 as opposed to specific metrics of traffic, traffic related air pollution like black carbon. I'm showing here some preliminary results of mass balance modeling that we're working with on our Harriet Tubman Middle School data set, where we're essentially attempting to apportion the source of particulate matter, various metrics of particulate matter, into the contributors that, uh, that uh, contribute to the, the loading of particulate matter in the school. So what we're able to do here is to determine the contribution to particulate matter from the outdoor air fraction of supply air, from the recirculation fraction of supply air from the building and from occupants and their activities. I'm showing here on the right a plot of the source uh, from these four contributors for both black carbon and for PM 2.5 um, fine particulate matter. The main difference between these two metrics of particulate matter is that for PM 2.5, we see a large fraction of the source due to occupants and their activities. Whereas for black carbon, uh, the major contributor is that of the outdoor air fraction of supply air. The final topic I wanna to touch on is that there is chemistry that can happen in, in schools that can generate fine particulate matter. Some volatile organic compounds of indoor origin are chemically reactive. For example, limonene is uh, a VOC that can react with ozone to contribute to fine particulate matter levels in schools uh, due to the formation of secondary organic aerosol. In the interest of time, I, I won't dig into this plot in full detail, but essentially in our school, I mentioned briefly that we have a carbon scrubber uh, present in the air cleaning system, system, and we think we see evidence that this carbon scrubber is suppressing levels of SOA precursors monoterpenes and ozone, such that we are suppressing secondary organic aerosol formation. And in the plot on the right, I'm showing that we see few uh, particle formation events when the air handler is on and lower total, total particle counts in outdoor air than in indoor air when the air handler is turned off. So during the middle of the night, when the school is unoccupied, we see higher total particle counts uh, uh, in indoor air than outdoor air, which we think is evidence of uh, chemical reactions that are forming fine particulate matter. So to conclude, there are opportunities for reducing fine particulate exposures in near roadway schools. They include in potentially increasing the distance from outdoor sources, altering the timing of activities, installing air cleaning, addressing indoor sources, and, and possibly quenching indoor chemistry via air cleaning or source reduction. There are research, research and certainly resource needs for schools, including better data on the efficacy of installed interventions. There were only eight studies of uh, efficacy uh, in occupied schools that, that I was able to identify in the literature. Schools need lower energy and lower maintenance methods for ventilation and air cleaning. The study that I focused on, the Harry Tubman Middle School, was certainly a, an intensive um, air cleaning intervention. More research on PM source strengths in schools, and, and finally, this was brought up during week one and week two, studies on the health impact of exposures to PM of indoor origin. Okay, so with that, I, I want to acknowledge uh, Orly Laguerre, Dr. Linda George, and Brett Stinson, who have been close collaborators on this work, and funding from the Portland Public Schools, and a National Science Foundation STEM grant that provided uh, resources for students to engage on the, on the, on the work. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I think we're a little over time, so I want to hold some questions for you until uh, our next uh, presentations that 